It's a particular honour to be invited to present this year's A.W. Howard Lecture. The only connection I have with Alfred Howard is that we both spent considerable amounts of our working life in the mountains of eastern Victoria, mapping its Paleozoic rocks. Both of us did part of this work along rivers. A.W. accompanied by an, Arab, an Aboriginal man and I with a party of fellow geologists. A highlight in my case were the three weeks rafting the Snowy River from the New South Wales border to Buchan and several weeks mapping the shoreline of Lake Dartmouth from a dinghy. One of the principal problems that a geologist has when mapping an area is how old are these rocks? With igneous rocks, meaning those rocks that have crystallised from a liquid magma, it can be done by precise measurement of radioactive minerals, which will give you an absolute age. However, most of the rocks that form Victoria's basement are sedimentary rocks, laid down in an ancient, on an ancient sea floor in a 100 million year long episode that began 500 million years ago and ended around 400 million years ago. There are places where the two mix. For instance, in, in North America, uh, the graptolytic sequence has tufts interbedded in it. And these are, these are volcanic eruptions that are big enough to have material falling into oceans, settling down into a bed. That's a tuff. And this has got radio radioactive minerals in it. So you can tell the precise age of these things. Same in, uh, in uh, Norway, in, uh, in Scandinavia, they have the same. These rocks can only be dated using fossils, and this is where graptolites come in. We have a fossil, uh, a, a fossil called Climacograptus bicornis, which is an important correlation tool worldwide because it's found worldwide. Nemograptus gracilis is another beautiful looking graptolite, beautiful arc like that, big things coming out the outside, lovely thing. When I found that in a museum, only about a third of it was exposed. No, a quarter of it was exposed. I had to dig out the rest of it using a, 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 a pneumatic um, drilling tool. So what exactly are these graptolites? They're quite small, mostly less than 10 centimetres across, and their most characteristic feature is the jigsaw profile of their branches, as you can see here. This slab from Willie's Quarry near Wood End shows at least half a dozen different species, other than the big one, which can be seen hiding in the branches. Like these V-shaped ones here, Isograptus and Paraisograptus. This big V-shaped one here, also different species of Isograptus. These oval ones here, Philograptus. And this much more slender and smaller specimen here. These are typical of Victorian graptolites in that they lie flat on bedding planes in the shale. However, there are places where you find graptolites that are much better preserved. In some limestones, for instance, the original material that housed the graptolites can be preserved in 3D and that they can be dissolved out with acid. This shows that the colonies are constructed of simple tubes which are the branches, with small overlapping tubes on one side of the branches, giving access to the outside. Hence, the entire structure is called tubarium, and the individual branches are called stipes. From such simple beginnings, it's of course obvious that there is scope for enormous variation. These are tuberia of six different species, six different genera, using the number of stipes and the pattern and spacing of branching as identifying characters. In the one on the top left, there's no systematic branching pattern, but nevertheless, it's able to fill the space fairly evenly. The next one in the middle has a similar sort of branching, but it's much more regular, much, much better space, much more organized. The one on the top right has its branches joined by little joints, it called the sepiments, to stop them from tangling. Uh, same and the one at the bottom right. The middle one at the bottom has much more spaced branching. It's 
So you get a very much more open effect. And the one at the bottom left is a, is a cone, now flattened, of course. In this sampling here, the branching pattern is much clearer. Seven of these have only four terminal stipes, but all have completely different appearances. These, 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 that one and that one. They all have four stripes, but they all look very different, very different in plan. These ones here have four stripes, but they're joined back to back like that. So that when you look at them from the top, they look like a cross. This one on the right here has two main stripes with secondary stripes shooting off at regular intervals in opposite directions. Now you may have perceived a pattern here. I've arranged all of these with the little pointy bits at the centre. Pointing upwards. The pointy bit is called a sicula, which is the centre of symmetry of the tuberia. The sicula is where it all began. It's the first structure formed by the zygote. It looks a bit like a witch's hat, or for those of you who've never met a witch, a traffic cone. It's tiny, rarely reaching two millimetres in length. By convention, it's always shown with the pointy end up. The other end is open, and this is where the zooid was able to communicate with, with its environment. The primordial butt that lived in the, in the secular gave rise to daughter zooids, which built their own little tubes. And these are called theci, Latin for cups, and so on, thus building the entire tuberium. You can think of this as modular housing. This slide shows it by serial graptolite, meaning that two stripes are joined like that, grow upwards. The little holes on the side are called the apertures. These structures here are the theci, in this case, another one here, another one there, and the slits in between are thecal apertures, which is where the zooids were able to protrude and send out feeding, feeding apparatus like here. Where did they actually come from? Did they just all of a sudden explode on the scene or were there, uh, were there sort of they, precursors? Actually, they arrived in the Cambrian and have, we have the, the earliest ones in the Cambrian, in, uh, at Monageta, for instance, okay. and at Heathcote. Uh, uh, the same faunas. Are they simple? No, well, they look a bit more like, they actually they look like hydras, the modern hydras. They're sort of uh, related to, to corals. Hmm. <laughs> Soft-bodied animals that never get preserved, but these were preserved. These obviously had uh, harder material, uh, and they're they're thought to be the ancestors. But we don't know what <coughs> what preceded them. Yeah, you know, they they're mm. not. There's nothing in the birded shell, for instance, that looks like graptolites. Mm. Mm. What use are graptolites? It sound, turns out that there are quite a few things that make them extremely useful. For a start, they're marine and they are free-floating, which meant they were distributed all over the marine environment. Quite a few species are found worldwide, which is really good for correlation. They evolved very rapidly, and importantly, they expressed their evolution in the way they constructed their colonies. These were made of tough collagen. It's able to survive strong compaction and folding. They're common in regions called fold belts, which are composed of rocks mostly deposited at great depth in the sea that have been strongly folded and deformed during mountain building events, called orogenies. Graptolites have survived all this and, often, and are often the only fossils that occur in such rocks. Our Victorian rocks have gone through several orogenies one at around 440 million years ago, and another one at about 385 million years ago. Graptolites that are useful for dating rocks lived from the beginning of the Ordovician to the end of the early Devonian, the length of the red bar on the left. In Victoria, their useful range is confined to the Ordovician, the mauve bar. They're too sporadic in the younger rocks to be of any use. On the basis of their rapid evolution, Victorian Ordovician 
has been subdivided into graptolite biozones, each lasting about one to two million years. By zonation, I mean the arrangement of rocks into succession of packages, each with its own top typical fossil or fossils, a bit like numbered pages in a book. These are arranged in groups of zones called stages in the middle column there, Bull Indian Gisbornian. They're named from places where the faunas of that particular stage were best shown, like Lancefielding at the bottom, Kesselmanian, the darker blue one, etc. How is this achieved? Well, surprisingly, there are fewer than half a dozen people who worked out the Ordovician Graptolite Zonation in Victoria as we know it today. So who were these people? The first person to collect systematically from Kesselman area was Thomas Sargent Hall, who in 1893 and 1895 published a landmark study that arranged the faunas he collected in Kesselman and knew about elsewhere into these seven zones. By 1905, he had given names to these zones and these names are still in use today. The next major advance was made by a schoolmaster. William Harris collected grapsolites in the Castlemaine region where Hall had cut his teeth. He distilled this into papers in 1916 and 1933 that provided a firm basis for fine subdivision of the Castlemanian stage. Like Hall's work, these papers are published in the Royal Society Proceedings. This diagram, don't worry about the details, this diagram shows how the various species are related in terms of age. Note that here on the right, the narrow column, he used a simple letter number code to label each biozone, an innovation that is still in use today. This figure shows the 27 taxa he described and illustrated in his 1933 paper. In 1935, Harris was joined by David Evan Thomas, a geologist working in the Victorian Geological Survey. As a Welshman, Thomas was interested in graptolites and, as he told me, in rugby, which he played in his young days. He shared a passion for trout fishing with Harris and quite a few of the papers they wrote together were the result of trout fishing trips in Victoria's mountains. Their partnership lasted 20 years and finished with Harris's death. The title of their last paper ended with Part 1. In other words, they still had plenty of stuff to do. In their first joint paper, in 1935, they monographed the fauna of the Darawillian, it's the Middle Order Vision, mainly of the Bendigo region. They illustrated and described 37, count them, 37 taxa, most of which are still valid today. This allowed them to subdivide the Darawillian into the four zones we recognise today. In 1938, they summarised the work that had been done over the previous decades and provided a new zonal scheme, adding two new stages, Teutonium and Eupenium, and gave the first subdivision of the late Ordovician into three stages. They introduced a new shorthand code system using the first two letters of each stage, e.g. BE for Bendigonian, together with the number of the zone this time counting upwards, so that BE1 is the oldest zone in the Bendigonian, etc. That brings us to the modern era that brought a more thorough treatment of taxonomy based on detailed studies of how colonies grew. Roger Cooper, who was a New Zealander, monographed the early and middle Ordovician graptolite sequence in, of Nelson in New Zealand, which is very similar to ours. He carried out a study of the evolution of isograptors, which shows increasing size of the colony over time, thus giving an improved method of subdividing the Teutonian to Darawillian sequence. He next looked at the oldest graptolites in Victoria from near Romsey, where, thanks to the thorough collection by collecting by Ian Stewart, he found a new graptolite zone. There's quite a strong change in latitudes between, between the uh, the temperate and, and more uh, arctic faunas than the tropical faunas. We were in the tropics. Australia was in the tropics in the order of fish. We had a much richer fauna. Uh, many of our animals don't correlate with any, anywhere else because they're only found here. 
in Victoria. They're mm. not even found in, in New Zealand. So I actually wrote a paper on, on one of them that, that had been uh, classified as two different animals and that turned out to be uh, an unu the, 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 had an unusual range in, in morphologies from like that to like this. And uh, they, so the, the two extremes had been described as two different fossils. And I showed, by showing all the intermediates, that's just one population. And they're all from the same locality. Roger and I got together to write a review of the Graptolite zonation of Australasia, meaning Australia and New Zealand, which we published in El Chiringa. A few years ago, I met the editor of El Chiringa, and he told me that our paper had been the most cited paper in El Chiringa for the entire time since it was published, which gave me quite a surprise, but also showed me that there's a wide interest in, Victor in the Victorian graptolite sequence. The paper gave illustrations of 160-odd graptolites, many of them not illustrated before. It included an entirely new zonation of the late Ordovician, based on my collections from East Gippsland, and a global correlation of the most important graptolite sequences. The Victorian sequence is, on, is the left narrow column, and you can see by the spacing of the lettering that it's actually the most subdivided sequence in the world. We use things like zone fossils to correlate, to tell, like, this country over there has a collection of, of graptolites, and it has a couple of graptolites that we find in one of our collections, and they, they immediately know that they must be of roughly the same age. And that's the way correlation works. And that's the way you can build up a zonation, because then you know that zone B sits on top of zone A and zone C is a bit higher, etc. Because they set, well, in, 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 in overseas they can collect uh, in successions, in, in, in uh, outcrops that range over you know, for quite a, quite a distance, and they can do collections in spots and say, oh yeah, this is higher than that, and that's lower than that. We can't do that. We can do that in, in uh, Yelmi, where we, we can walk up a creek and then collect here and then there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we've got, okay, we've got three or four different zones here. We now have an artificial rock sequence subdivided into 30 layers called graptolite zones, each with its own label and, more importantly, its own graptolite. This is the dream of geologists. We can walk to an outcrop and if it has graptolites in it, we can determine whether it's older or younger than the outcrop down the creek. No other paleontologist can do that. They have, to, they have to use a laboratory. They have to extract the fossils. We can see them. So what can we do with this skill? Well, I'm going to show you. On this map of Victoria, you can see that the eastern two-thirds of the state has rocks that could potentially have graptolites. I've selected two places where graptolites have been instrumental in mapping the rocks. First, the Benigo Goldfield. The rocks in this region are very monotonous slates and sandstone, and the only thing that can be mapped without the aid of fossils is folds. I will trace you the bedding in this cutting here. Here it goes, up there, up there, up there, and then it comes down here, and down there and there, and then it comes up here again. So there are two folds in this outcrop. Actually quite hard to see. These sort of rocks are typical of the entire Bendigo zone. So graptolites are the only way to map these rocks. Graptolites have been collected from the Bendigo region since the middle of the 19th century. And over the years, graptolite identifications from more than 3,000 localities have been gathered into a register. It's now available in digital form, by the way. These have made it possible to map the geology of the Bendigo goldfield at 1 to 10,000 scale on three maps that form a continuous north-south strip. This is one of those maps. Here the sequence has been subdivided into these seven units on the bottom left, colours. Colours range from blue, the oldest rocks, through brown and yellow, to purple, the youngest rocks in the deepest synclines. What this map shows is the zigzag pattern of plunging folds and how, for instance, 
and how continuous many of the folds are. Many of them have historical names that go back to the gold mining years, like Napoleon Anticline and Nell Gwyn Anticline. The map also shows, shows folds, many of which were encountered in the mines and stretch for tens of kilometres. You can see, by the way, you can see, by the way, some of the colours disappear. This is the same map, and now it shows the cross section at the bottom. So that's what the rocks look like, if, if you could see them at depth. Uh, at the top of the cross section, you see all those names coming out. They're the, they're the named folds and faults. The second example is from East Gippsland, the Olmi region. Here it was possible to map the rock units, such as the Bendok group in blue colours. The main unit of the Bendok group is the black shale, which I call the Warbisco shale. This occurs as long bands of quite variable width. These blue bands here, here, sometimes even disappearing altogether. The Bendok group shales have plenty of graptolites in it, like these. Careful sampling of the black shale bands showed that almost every one of them contained an almost complete succession of late Ordovician graptolites, from Gisbornian at the bottom through Estonian to Belindian at the top. The intervening turbidite belts, which I call the Elmi group, shown mainly in grey, also contain graptolites, but these are early Silurian, including this little beauty, Lituri graptus convolutus, which proves it's early Silurian. So this proved beyond doubt that the Elmi group was the youngest unit in the Paleozoic marine sedimentary sequence of the region, younger than the shales of the Bendok group, which gave me a structural problem, because there are several places where the sequence seems to pass up it from Yelmi group into Bendok group. Over here, for instance, you get Bendok group, older Bendok group, followed by younger Yelmi group, that's fantastic. And then you go upward and upward and upward and you meet Bendok group again. Well, how's that possible? It's that's older. And then you go back into Yelmi group again. Same thing over here. These, these beds are slightly overturned but they're all younging towards the west. So you start off in Bendok group, and you, end, you go into Yelmi group, and then you go back into, into Bendok group. What's going on there? In the end, I figured that the only solution to the problem is summarised in this diagram. This upper package of rocks here, Bendok group plus Yelmi group, has parted company with the older rocks underneath, Penax sandstone, which is lower order vision, along this long thrust, detachment it's called, and within the, within the upper sequence, there are multiple folds that climb up from the, from the base so that you can get Bendok group overlain by Yelmi group here, but over here, back in, you go back into Bendok group. Over here, it's these major folds that you just cannot see because the Bendok group happens to be a very slippery unit, which is acted like an oil, like a lubricant. So that's what graptolites have done here. There's no way that it could have been worked out without the precise dating of the rocks that we get from the graptolites. Now, I just want to spend the last few minutes on something that has received very, very little attention in the graptolite literature. Many of the smaller graptolites have spines. Why should this be? They're very sharp, as you can see. The obvious answer is for protection. During the long hours I spent looking down microscope of, at graptolites, I found the reason why protection was necessary. It was obvious that many of them had been attacked. You can see it on this slide, over here, over here. And you can see it even better in this slide here. This one here has four stipes, and they should all be of the same length. But this one has been bitten off. This one here also has, should have four stipes. But the fourth one is missing here. There's a little stump left coming out of here. This one is fairly obvious. This should be a symmetrical thing. But this has all been bitten off. 
And this one here, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious what's happened here. Now this thing also is a symmetrical graptolite, but there's a large part missing here. And the same thing has happened over here, and there's still a bit sort of hanging, hanging loose there. This one here should be straight, but it's not. It's, something has taken a bite out of here, and this, this little strand here, it's the end of this thing, structure called anema, is hanging loose. This one here, the attack has been sort of unsuccessful in that most of what's been bitten off is still attached. And this, this one here, it's, it's fairly obvious what's, what's happened there. Same here. Chewed away. This one's been torn apart. And this one, which, which should look like that, the whole top's missing. Where should we look for the guilty parties? One possibility is that the eel-like vertebrates that bore conodonts did the damage. Conodonts are tiny tooth-like structures made of phosphate that are found loose but can be reconstructed into fearsome-looking apparatuses as on the top left. Just as well they were so small. As you can see from the scales on the right-hand figure, those bars are 0.25 millimetres long. So one millimeter is four of those bars, end to end. There may be other candidates, but we just don't know. Fish, very little known about ordovician fish. Mollusks, cephalopods are present in the ordovician, but we have no record of their feeding habits. And the crustacea is similar. So what we need in Victoria, or around the world, is a Berger shale of ordovician age, because the Berger shale has revealed so many animals that we knew nothing about, that, you know, there's still a lot not known. The fossils that are known from the, the Baltic are the little sessile things, you know, tiny things growing on the sea bottom, and they're simple little tubes, but they have the same sort of rings from, half rings from which the uh, graptolite tuberi are built. It's the only other animal that does it in the world. Uh, there's no other phylum has animals, has constructions like that. And uh, about five years ago, uh, a, a mate of mine, um, Charles Mitchell, wrote a paper uh, listing all the points where graptolites, that graptolites have in, in common with this little thing, Rhabdopleura, uh, and he says, that's a graptolite. It's a living graptolite. Fonz, you've obviously had uh, a lot of material to work with, a huge geological collection going back to the, the 1850s when all this uh, first geological surveys were going on in Victoria. Um, where is that material and how did you get access to it? I think it's the largest uh, single collection in Museum Victoria and it's one of the most important ones in the world, I think. Um, the material is there. It's, it's actually quite well stored in that uh, stored by locality, uh, which is important because um, it's, it's very important to get a, an entire collection from a locality so you can see what the fauna is like. So you can see what went with this, uh, mm. like Mr. Mr. Jones lived with Mr. Smith, etc., etc. Really? Yeah, yes. that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so you can so you can rely on the fossils that you find in this collection were actually living at the same time. That's really important mm. for paleontology. Mm. Uh, and so if you, if somebody gives you a specimen and you, they can't tell you where it came from, you say. Oh, that'll look all right, you know, on a, on a metal piece, but it's not going to go into the museum. So, um, yeah. So I spent five years going through that collection mm. and uh, registering thousands of specimens and then photographing. And uh, photographing, fortunately, many, most of the photos have, have turned out good enough mm. to be the basis for the papers I've written since then. Is there much interchange uh, from overseas 
uh, paleontologists working with graptolites with the Victorian oh, sequence? Oh, yeah. Actually, uh, my first overseas trip connected with graptolites was, with, was to uh, England, where there was a, ca a, a graptolite conference at Cambridge. And um, by that time, I had struck up a correspondence with a bloke in, in uh, Glasgow University who was finishing his PhD. And he was working on exactly the same fauna mm. that I was working on at Darrowit Gwim. That's near, near um, Kilmore, mm. between Kilmore and uh, Lansfield. And uh, I was able to, to identify stuff that he hadn't, uh, and I'd, I'd identified it from the Chinese literature, which mm. he, hadn't, uh, he didn't have access to. Mm. So uh, we we formed a friendship, and uh, and he took me to to uh, his collecting area in Scotland, famous for mm. its uh, upper order fish and graptolites. Mm. So yeah, I made some quite nice uh, collections there. Mm. I was going to ask about um, whether we've got much more to learn about graptolites, or can we apply them in any other way? To um, I mean, correlation will be going on, but. In terms of Victorian ones, um, is there much more we can we can yeah, do now? Yeah, are there modern? Can, we can, are there younger geologists working on? We them? can yeah. make more collections. Yeah. A, uh, one of the papers I wrote on, I found a fauna that had been made a century ago. The only location given is is uh, a, a mine, an old gold mine, mm. obviously a small one, and it's a, it's a tiny collection. It's a, a, about half a drawer. And it had several new species in it, and they were quite well, quite well preserved. Mm. And it was it was entirely new. Uh, it was the best collection we had of a particular zone. Uh, and I was able to prove that all the other localities that had been ascribed to this zone by other Victorian and previous publications were wrong, because it had a younger fossil. They had a younger fossil in it, which I didn't have. I had the precursor of that, the mm. ancestor of that fossil. Mm. And, and I'd love to go back to that, that spot and make a bigger collection because I reckon there's more there. There's an interval in the, uh, near, near the top of the Ordovician that I was n never able to collect properly from mm. uh, because the, the, the rocks were not suitable enough. Mm. And... Uh, so, and I think there's more to be found. So, yeah, more collecting is, is the thing to do. Because my, my work in the last five years has relied entirely, seven years, has relied entirely on what was in the museum already. And, and, and a lot of it had not been cleaned properly because people who collect stuff don't have access to the special tools you need to clean stuff. I was able to do all that. I found lots of stuff that was really good.